and again, nothing we have written or spoken about would it, would say that it isn't possible that oil could go to two hundred or three hundred dollars a barrel. Our view is simply that the harder you stretch the rubber band, the more violent the reaction would be. The world、um, has more than enough primary energy, which is why you see natural gas where it is, where you, why you see coal where it is, and oil would be lower were it not for the geopolitical tensions that we have, both in the proxy war between Russia and Ukraine, and also the war in the Middle East. Claim that we don't believe there will be a recession in time to affect the 2024 presidential elections. I had mentioned that I was short-term a little cautious. Uranium, you know, things don't go up exponentially.、Mm-hmm. I think gold is setting up for a very interesting 2024. If we were really going to build out electric vehicles and solar and wind to the extent that we've been told, you wouldn't expect copper to be where it is. What all that you're telling me here is is not very bullish. Graphite, nickel, lithium. Um, manganese, cobalt, all these things. All right, Doomberg.、Um, too much to talk about here, really, because it's been it's been too long since you and I spoke.、Uh, and I want to kick it off with with a simple question on the topic of、um, atlases, if you will.、Uh, so, what will Atlas shrug or not? Yeah, first, Antonio, great to be back.、Uh, congratulations on all your success. It's fun to watch you grow, and、uh, happy to、um, to be back on your show. So, you're referring to a piece we just published called Atlas Won't Shrug, which is sort of our Final word on the matter of peak cheap oil.、Um, we published in late 2023 a, a piece which turned out to be far more controversial than we could have ever imagined. That and that piece was titled、um, "Peak Cheap Oil Is a Myth," which we've long believed to be true.、Um, there's no doubt that we oscillate between shortage and glut and crisis and and uh, economic uh,、um, peace, but that. Sort of upward sloping sine wave of of energy consumption of humanity continues、um, unabated, regardless of the crises that may present themselves. But there's a、um, a a legion of of really smart people who believe that peak cheap oil is either here or will soon be here, and and that its occurrence will present catastrophic challenges to humanity and will materially impact the standard of living, especially of those in the West and. And we just don't believe that to be true. We have tried to, as politely as possible, articulate our views on the matter, and we sum them all up in the most recent piece,、mm. Atlas Won't Shrug, which of course is a play on the famous、uh, Ayn Rand work. And、um, and so it, it's been fun to to write a series of pieces on the matter and talk about them on podcasts, and I'm happy to go into details、uh, here with you today. What's cheap? Because when you discuss Peak cheap oil. It, it suggests that well, but there's a bunch of there's a bunch of bu- people who are bullish on oil out there. They don't think and, and they think that oil will never be as cheap again. But what, what is cheap? I mean, seventy bucks cheap is a hundred cheap? Well, that's a great question. So when you look at the price of oil in dollars, you're actually measuring two prices. You're measuring the price of oil and you're measuring the price of U.S. dollars.、Hmm. And one of the most interesting things about this debate is.、Um, We created this chart which shows the you know, 50 years of of inflation-adjusted cost of oil. So Bloomberg has this great index where it just divides the price of oil by its inflation index, and you can see that oil is as cheap as it was when Reagan came to office.、Uh, and in fact, here's a really fascinating thing: the the overlap in the Venn diagram of people who think oil, you know, peak cheap oil is behind us. And people who think that the U.S. government has been fudging their inflation data is quite high, but both can't be true if you look at the inflation-adjusted chart. Because if you actually plug in what you believe to be real inflation, then oil is as cheap as it's ever been.、Um, and so,、uh, the way we prefer to express the price of oil, of course, is in ounces of gold. And when you look at the long-term, you know, fifty-year chart of oil as priced in gold, it's in the bottom. Quartile of where it has ever been,、uh, mm-hmm. and nothing about the chart screams that we're on the cusp of、uh, a major market dislocation.、Um, there's a lot of reasons why we believe this to be true. The very definition of oil is going、uh, undergoing a semantic shift. There's a whole menu of options that humanity can and would and does use to supplement、um, the work that we extract from oil using other hydrocarbons or sources of electricity, and so. The definition of cheap, in our view,、um, means a price at which economies of the world can grow、um, without much interruption.、Right. And and the the real 
thing that peak cheap oil proponents are selling, of course, is the negative consequences that would come thereafter. Um, and again, nothing we have written or spoken about would it, would say that it isn't possible that oil could go to two hundred or three hundred dollars a barrel. Our view is simply that the harder you stretch the rubber band, the more violent the reaction would be, the more violent the response would be, because there's way more than enough hydrocarbons under the earth for way more than long enough. And this maybe also begs the question. Um, this might be a very big question, uh, a, a very basic question, really. We all know that it's ultimately supply and demand dynamics that dictate the prices of commodities, including oil. But what are both sides of that equation influenced by the most in our time? As in, what's the biggest driver for oil supply? What's the biggest driver for oil demand? And with that, why I'm even thinking about this is with the state of those, why isn't oil $10 a barrel if there's so much out of it out there? Or why is it, isn't it it $500 if there's so many issues in transporting it and whatnot? Well, interesting you should say that because natural gas in the U.S. is currently trading at an energy equivalent price of $10 a barrel of oil. Mm. Um, and, and it's because we have an abundance of it. We're swimming in it and we can't get rid of it. Why, you know, what sets the price of oil in the short, medium and long term uh, is an interesting set of questions. So our view is that in the short term, the primary drivers of the price of oil are where we are in the cycle because the capital expansion cycle of the commodity sector is often out of sync with the broader business cycle. Um, and then sentiment. So where people think prices are going, risk premiums, geopolitics, and so on. Uh, in the medium term, um, very similar where we are in the cycle. Um, and then in the long term, um, technology is the primary driver. Um, and the thing that most proponents of peak cheap oil get wrong is they vastly underestimate the, the massive technical powerhouses that are the modern commodity players. Um, because Wall Street doesn't love these companies and they trade at low multiples and they're constantly under attack by the ESG crowd, it is easy to take for granted the tens of thousands of brilliant scientists and engineers and technicians and field workers that do this amazing work that makes modern life possible for us all. But they exist. They do amazing work. Technology is growing at an exponential pace. The concept of horizontal drilling and, and fracking was a, a dream 15 years ago. And in those 15 years, the U.S. has added two and a half Saudi Arabias to its energy mix. Uh, we're the number one producer of oil by a wide margin. We're the number one producer of natural gas by a wide margin. We're a major exporter of coal. Um, we have you know, uh, nuclear power. Um, and so the U.S. is an energy gigapower, and it's doing this with a, a hand and a half tied behind its back. Um, you can't drill in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. You can't drill along any of the coasts of Florida or much of the Atlantic and Pacific coasts and parts of Alaska on land. The difficulties in getting permits at both state and federal levels means we have huge resources that are temporary, temporarily off limits because of politics. And our view is if we did see $200 or $300 oil, uh, the politicians who are basically Malthusian climate alarmists would be wiped away in a political revolution rather quickly, and we would embark upon whatever it would need uh, to be done to correct the shortage of primary energy, the oil uh, included amongst them. And so um, this is forever thus. Um, for as long as there has been oil, there has been people worried about the fact that we might run out of it. Um, but when you just look at the 40 or 50 year chart of oil in ounces of gold or the inflation adjusted price of oil, it's just not there. And I don't know what data people would need to see, but take, for example, that the price spike of uh, the, the, the predated the global financial crisis where oil traded above $145 a barrel. I believe within 12 months, it, it collapsed 70%. Mm -hmm. um, this is the way commodities work. Um, and having been in the industry for several decades, we have a firsthand understanding of the technology power embedded within that sector, and it would come to our rescue as it always does. Right. Is it maybe, as you mentioned, a 40 or 50 year, year chart here? Is it maybe a, a timeline thing that gets to this agreement going, basically? Because well, what you're telling me here is a, a good framework for a long term outlook on where oil prices might be headed, which is to say moderately um, and peacefully higher, but still cyclical as a commodity. But then over the short run, all of the events that, that are happening right now um, and that have always been happening, really, that you mentioned at the beginning of that piece, um, 
Atlas won't shrug, they do create volatility. And that could, again, be potentially yeah. taken advantage of, right? So maybe people are just saying, oh, this is well, peak cheap oil translated to my five-year brain is just this is the bottom for oil. Maybe it's the bottom for oil or what they mean is for the next three to five years, something like that. Yeah. So when challenged, that's not what they say, though. Um, mm -hmm. So I, and I would say, like, I would argue, for example, we had a very interesting and polite debate with Adam Rosenzweig from uh, GNR on Adam Taggart's new show, Thoughtful Money. And um, we need more of such discussions in our view, and we were happy to participate in it. But um, it, in listening to the podcast afterwards, um, everything that Adam Rosenzweig articulated to me did not constitute PG oil. Okay, if shale rolls over, we're going to have a problem, but we'll fix the problem. And, and again, I started this by saying two or three hundred dollar oil is totally possible. The inelasticity of demand for commodities makes that more than likely. And in fact, we just saw it in Europe. Um, we mentioned how natural gas is selling for ten dollars a barrel in the U.S. Well, it wasn't that long ago that it was selling for six hundred dollars a barrel uh, in Europe. Uh, that's an amazing spread. Uh, why? Because if you run out of these commodities, you know, uh, it, it becomes a, a, an urgent emergency. But yet. Within a year, those prices had collapsed 80%, and now they're down to less than $10 a million BTU again. Um, it, it didn't take long. Um, it was a real crisis. If it had been a really rough winter, it, it, the consequences of that crisis would have begun to resemble um, what so sort of the peak cheap oil people fear. But even if we had a dastardly cold winter, um, you know, um, it wouldn't have represented peak cheap natural gas. It would just mean that we'd have an even bigger supply glut than we have now. Mm. So in conclusion, then commodities are cyclical. I don't, I mean, I don't see anything to argue about yeah. or with there to begin and with. We have, and we have more than enough. And there's other things we would do. Like um, ultimately believing in a concept like peak cheap oil is a short bet against human ingenuity. Um, we're always one geopolitical crisis away from a massive price spike in commodities. We saw it with the energy crisis developing organically and then Russia taking advantage of European weakness and moving into Ukraine. Um, we saw oil spike. And look, what, as we said in the piece, what happened? Joe Biden released one million barrels a day for six months. That's um, one percent of global daily supply for half a year. So half a percent of annual supply. And the price of oil was cut in half. It, mm. it wouldn't take much. Um, it just wouldn't take much and we would do it. It's maybe also when you, well, you can maybe call those spikes, uh, um, well, they're not anomalies. I wanted to call them anomalies, but they're not because that's just how the market operates that happen in the prices of commodities, right? But there have been far fewer of those spikes than there have been geopolitical or global crises. Uh, if you just, well, I mean, if you just look back over whatever period of history, you just see that there's always a crisis, right? Um, and not always is that combined with a spike in commodity prices. Uh, yeah, I would say the ongoing war in the Middle East um, has surprised us in the sense that its impact on the oil market has been relatively subdued. You know, mm -hmm. if you had told me that the Houthis would be shutting down the Red Sea with missiles and that there would be a major war between Israel and the Palestinians that looked likely to spread... Uh, to, to the north, and that the U.S. was uh, on the cusp of a kinetic confrontation with Iran, I wouldn't have guessed that WTI would be sub eighty dollars a barrel in that scenario. But mm -hmm. at the same time, oil went from you know minus thirty seven dollars a barrel front month contract um, at at expiration uh, at the peak of the COVID crisis, and then within a you know a short period of time, it was trading above one hundred twenty five again. Um, so we do see these spikes of volatility, and and in a way. You can view the subdued uh, price action in the oil markets, despite what's going on in the Middle East, as the markets signaling to us that they don't believe a U.S. war with Iran um, is likely. And if you do think that war is likely, then, of course, the market is giving you an opportunity to place your bets accordingly. And that as an observer of the market, um, we would say that that's the signal they're sending, that somehow, some way, there will not be a major confrontation in the Middle East. Because if we do end up with a direct kinetic conflict with Iran and Lindsey Graham gets his way and we start carpet bombing refineries um, uh, in the country of Iran. I mean, I, I can't see oil staying where it is, but that would not constitute peak cheap oil. That would just constitute a crisis that triggered a spike that we'll eventually overreact to. Mm -hmm. It's and it might be, well, it's probably just me, but I had I had you sort of mentally classified, if you will, as an oil bull 
since the first time we spoke. I classify people in my head in, in broad boxes, if you will. But listening to what you're telling me here and, and what you've told me over the last two or so years, it sounds like a, a lot of what, what I thought were the main things that, that helped me classify you basically has changed since those things started happening. Is that is that the case? Well, we came on the scene during an energy crisis hmm. and um, we were early to call it and then late to call that it was over, if we're being fully honest, if we graded ourselves in that time period. But as we have matured, and have decided to do this professionally, we have been conscious to try to to act and to behave as analysts and not advocates. And I think there's an important distinction between those two sets of people in the content creation world. Um, an analyst tries their best to look at the data and come to a conclusion, whereas an advocate looks at the data and tries to uh, confirm a belief. Hmm. And um, our... We have always believed, by the way, that peak cheapo was a myth. It just never really came up in any conversations because during an energy crisis, you know, there's more urgent things to talk about. Um, but our view on the energy markets that we had flipped from short to long, and, and I'll pause here and say, we've said from the very beginning, the most important question an analyst should ask themselves when looking at an economy is whether that economy is net short or net long primary energy. And the very question implies that there are two potential answers to, to that uh, question. And we really came to the conclusion that we were in a world of energy excess when we spent a month studying the global natural gas markets in October and into November to prepare for our monthly Doom Zoom for our pro tier subscribers, where we gave a you know, 45 slide presentation on methane and the natural gas markets and um, we we wrote a subsequent piece called Liquefied Natural Glut, and we believed that there was so much natural gas that it was going to be bearish for other primary uh, commodities as well. We felt that since this was a change in our worldview, it was important enough, and we sent that pro tier talk for free to all of our paying regular paying subscribers. And then we've written a bunch of pieces uh, on the matter. So in our view, today, the world um, has more than enough primary energy, which is why you see natural gas where it is, where you, why you see coal where it is, and oil would be lower were it not for the geopolitical tensions that we have, both in the proxy war between Russia and Ukraine and also the war in the Middle East. Um, and you know, the moment energy becomes short again, we will flip our position. And so we intend to be in this business for decades. And I think it's important to be honest with your subscribers and articulate, like we, we have a rule, we believed 100% of everything we ever wrote when we hit send. Um, we would never write something we don't believe, but our beliefs have to change with data. Uh, otherwise, we risk becoming just an advocate, and there's no shortage of those in the world. Mm. What's the saying? Strong beliefs, loosely held, something along those lines, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And and again, like um, if we had done that natural gas analysis and believed that the world was still in a shortage, we, we wouldn't have written those things. We would have been wrong, but... You know, when we looked around the world and we added it all up and we saw what was going on in the Permian and we saw what was going on in Marsalis and we saw what was going on with, in Qatar and Russia and and the build out of both LNG import and export capacity, we, we came to the conclusion that natural gas was in a glut. And natural gas is, you know, some almost a, a fifth of global primary energy and primary energy is relatively fungible. And so that acts as a significant headwind to the entire primary energy complex. Um, and so if you believe that to be true, you have to write it, even if it goes against things you've written in the past. Is that not flipping right now, though? Because what I'm thinking about is something that I recently read maybe yesterday or the day before that. Um, it's actually a, a running theme. Some of the producers in the U.S., when it comes down to natural gas, what I'm reminded is uh, they're reducing their expected outputs for 2024. Most recently, Chesapeake, which is soon to be the largest producer in the U.S., I believe. They're planning on um, cutting its out their output by 30% for this year, citing low prices and seeing that the market is oversupplied. Um, and, I mean, that's causing at least short-term term turbulence. Do you think this might mark the the, the intermediate-term bottom for, for gas here? Could be. Um, as we're recording this, the latest weekly natural gas storage report will print in a few minutes. Um, and, of course... 
the extent to which producers, especially in the U.S., have hedged their 2024 exposures prior to the floor falling out from under them um, will determine the level of voluntary curtailments like what you just said. And, and it is our belief that the market, is, especially in the U.S., is signaling to U.S. producers that it needs to slow down production. The primary driver, and, and we got this wrong in a piece we published recently, and we'll probably figure out a way to incorporate a correction in a future one. Um, the primary driver of the recent collapse of natural gas prices, of course, is an unusually warm weather in the U.S. Um, given natural gas's role in, in home heating, it is very, very sensitive to um, you know heating degree day numbers. And when if you look at the seasonality chart uh, aggregated across the U.S., we are having an, an exceptionally warm weather pattern for this time of year when we're supposed to be making big draws in the natural national storage um you know we, we we're seeing less and less natural gas being used as i'm recording this today it's probably 15 degrees warmer than average uh, in the city that i live in it's a, it's been a wonderful february compared to normal but at the same time um that's not exactly bullish for natural gas and so we, we will see curtailments but calling bottoms and trading natural gas in general of course is they call it the widow maker trade for a reason uh, it's very very difficult to trade such things mm -hmm. um but you know, you mix in Biden playing politics with LNG export approvals and so on. Um, it, it is it is a, a bit of despair in the market. And of course, you can't have a bottom without despair. But the presence of despair does not necessarily mean a bottom. And we'll see what uh, what oil, uh, what natural gas does from here. But yes, I, I, you know, I suspect the EQTs of the world and and so on. Um, Southwesterns are, are looking at their production plans. Um, and observing how much are you know um, hedged out or contracted out, and and how much uh, are exposed to, sh to the short end of the curve, and deciding whether and, and how to cut back production, which is the way markets work, as you say. I mean, it's a cyclical industry. Hmm. And and there's a catchy saying in cyclical industry that the uh, the cure for low prices is low prices. Mm -hmm. But I think you and I have in the past discussed that the cure for low prices is low prices times time. So it takes time for the low prices to to cure those low prices what, what's that component for natural gas how long do you think it's going to take oh i think um given the proliferation of drilling technology and the efficiency with which these companies can can flexibilize their production it it it, it wouldn't take as long as historical um you know this the the evolution of controlled production um amongst especially the U.S. operators in the shale patch is phenomenal. And so this is why, of course, you know, when the Saudis tried to beat back the shale oil revolution with a price war, they were just so much more flexible and able to toggle on and off. And the Saudis ended up losing that war, um, which is why the U.S. now produces, you know, 20 million barrels a day of oil and petroleum products and 25 percent of the world's natural gas. And so um, there will be a, a supply response. It's always a game of chicken. You know, what's your marginal cost of production and so on. And and of course, the CEOs of such companies know that they make all their money in price, not volume, but uh, Wall Street still rewards um, growth. And this is why commodity companies have such low multiples, because Wall Street hates this stuff. They want to see growth like NVIDIA, and they more than overpay for it over time. And uh, And ultimately, in our view, I think commodity companies are probably best or better held privately. Hmm. What's uh, if they're yeah? I suppose if they're producers, that's just instantly explorers and develop, developers pop into my gambling mind. But uh, it, that's a good point. What do you, how do you how do you then short this market? Basic is what I'm trying to ask here. I mean, it's it's not maybe not directly, but do you buy something else that then is technically a short on on oil and gas? Yeah. So we don't trade in the public markets as a disclaimer, but if oil is artificially cheap and manufacturers in the U.S. get to price their product at global prices, then they would be in a good position to take advantage of these things, assuming their own industry hasn't overbuilt and their own local supply dynamics are, are pretty decent. But there's the whole manufacturing boom underway in the U.S. because of this, this pool of, of the world's cheapest hydrocarbons here available to be burned. We, we did a whole piece on this um, where we showed just how valuable natural gas is to the economy and and in our view explains why there is no recession in the u.s um much to the chagrin of people who were hoping for one or expecting one i would say and had placed their bets accordingly um we of course thought there would be a recession 
And we thought the production of energy in the U.S. would peak, and and neither did. And so we made errors, and we decided to go figure out why we made those errors, and, and came up with the conclusions that we did, especially when we studied the natural gas market in the fall, like I told you. And so um, the way to sort of get long the beneficiaries of this hmm. is to find out who uses natural gas, and most importantly, gets the price of their products on um, on, on on international markets. But even that has been, you know, in general, um, most commodity players, even the derivatives of energy, make most of their money in a crisis because you have pricing power in a crisis. Um, and when energy is this cheap, you tend to have an abundance of derivatives of energy too, which is why you see fertilizer and corn and soybeans in the tank as well. And so um, I, I don't know the best way to articulate a bearish view. Uh, uh, on energy, um, that's for you know listeners and individuals to figure out within the context of their own portfolios. Mm -hmm. Bearish energy is is bullish margins for gold producers, for example, or copper producers. Is that what you meant? So I mean, among the lines of what you meant? Yeah, uh, sure. Those would be examples, and they're not. You know, they're, the energy is an input; they're not direct derivatives, like fertilizer, for example. Um, uh, the price of gold, of course, has a variety of other inputs and outputs and flows, but energy is certainly an important one. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, mining companies would benefit, but at the same time, if the commodity sector is experiencing a tailwind, it's all a matter of the delta between costs and, and pricing power, of course. Yeah. Or Unilever, because apparently they make Vaseline. So that's well, kind of cool. The, 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 the headline is, when energy is long, countries that have manufacturing sectors that can take advantage of that do well. And when energy is short, countries that have a massive amount of energy production do well. The U.S. happens to be both, which makes it a very unique um, petrostate, if you will. Okay. So bullish U.S., that's what I should write down. Well, compared to expectations, although those expectations are quickly getting re-rated. You know, that's the other thing. You could have a view, but then you have to determine, has the market already priced in that view? Correct. Yeah, that's well said. You mentioned something about when you mentioned I wasn't planning on talking about recession, all these things, they're um, oversaturated in, in coverage online. But you said that neither did materialize. You didn't say neither hasn't, as in, I mean, it's behind your back. You don't think a, a recession is coming. Am I reading that correctly? Well, certainly uh, we've made the specific claim that we don't believe there will be a recession in time to affect the 2024 presidential elections. Um, and this is the real hot button issue, you know, Bidenomics and Trump looks like he's set to win the nomination and it's going to be an ugly fight. And we are fearful that neither side will accept whatever outcome emerges. And we could be in store for a significant political upheaval in the U.S., which could be approximate cause of a recession down the road. But in a time frame that matters, i.e. 2024, it's, it, the data has supported since we made that call. Um, that there is no real recession on on the horizon. And and why would there be? You have manufacturing, pretty impressive, you know, um, uh, manufacturing base in the U.S. That's only growing as companies see the need to onshore and friendshore out of China in particular as, as uh, tensions rise uh, with, with the communists in China. Um, and you have uh, the world's cheapest and largest source of hydrocarbons readily available. Um, that's not, if you inject two and a half Saudi Arabia's into a manufacturing sector, have you been to Saudi Arabia? Have you seen the buildings? I mean, energy wealth. Here's, here's the thing that's, that's amazing. Everybody knows that if oil spikes, we'll get a recession, right? Everybody knows that Germany is suffering because it screwed up its energy policy. Hmm. We produce an enormous amount of oil and gas and nuclear power and coal. Why would we expect, given that, that we would, we would have an energy uh, we would have a recession uh, given given those cards to play. Um, even Biden can't screw those cards up. Gasoline is less than three dollars a gallon nationwide, or close to it. Um, home heating has never been cheaper. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, 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 this, these are real headwinds or tailwinds, sorry, for an economy. And um, and it's, it's it's amazing that we can see the negative side but can't give credit to the positive side. Look, Biden deserves very little of the credit for this. I mean, this is really state level regulators that kept, especially in Texas and Louisiana and so on, that kept the, the energy spigots open. Mm. Um, but he is a primary political beneficiary of it. Um, all things being equal, cheap energy in the U.S. is, is bullish for the incumbent. Mm. If a Republican were in office, it'd be bullish for their election. 
our re-election prospects as well. And I just think as an analyst, you have to acknowledge that fact. If energy messed up Germany, getting energy right in the US has to be good for us. I like your return sort of to first principles and relating everything to energy in one of uh, your recent pieces. I don't know what the title was, but you wrote that energy is not influenced by the economy. Energy is the economy. And um, yeah, I, I like how you can explain. Maybe you should try and explain my wife's moods with energy, too. I'm sure there is a way to do that because it returns <laughs> to first principles, but might be harder. Uh, I leave that one for you. I've been trying, though. Don't get me wrong. We, we're not talking much about uh, coal, and I did want to bring that up because there seems to be a discrepancy between thermal coal and metallurgical coal in terms of prices. I believe metallurgical coal is is up like 50% or so year on year. Um, I, I don't know how that fits within your framework, but you mentioned it there when you just mentioned the U.S. Um, yeah, any any. I mean, I, I don't even know how to ask it because I haven't really been following, but I did notice the 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 discrepancy again between the two types of coal. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, um, we pointed out, and the market, of course, observed that during the peak of the of the um, energy crisis in Europe, there was a period of time where thermal coal was was trading higher than metallurgical coal, which had never happened before, and it was truly um, amazing. Um, metallurgical coal, especially during times of relative coal abundance, which we have now, tends to price and react to. Um, the steelmaking sector much more so than um, than thermal coal does. Of course, thermal coal is basically agnostic to um, steelmaking sector, except to the extent that they draw on power, you know, and so on. Um, and so they, unless there's a crisis, they tend to be relatively, let's say, more uncorrelated than you would see different grades of crude. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me that coking coal um, is having a bit of a run. Um, I haven't looked at the market in a while to give you sort of any two or three bullet points as to why that would be, but I do understand why thermal coal is, is back to more reasonable levels because natural gas is, um, and you know, hydropower in China, which we wrote about, can influence the price of thermal coal as well. Uh, and so um, they, they can decouple, they often do decouple. Um, Met coal is a premium product used for, a, a primarily used for a completely different vertical. And so, um, you know, when there's plenty of, of thermal coal, um, met coal can can reassert itself as a premium product, which it seems to be doing now. Hmm. But given your view of of there being no recession but energy abundance, that oh. makes you bullish met coal. Uh, and... No, no, I would say no U.S. recession. That does not mean there isn't going to be a recession in China or that China, China uh, or the, or Europe is already in one. And by the way, if a major financial crisis does break out in China, that's the kind of thing that could drag the U.S. into a recession. We we have been careful to say all things being equal, it doesn't look like the U.S. is set for a recession. But if all things are no longer equal and something material changes, then, the, then of course, you have to look at the new data set. It's very hard to penetrate Chinese economic data as a Westerner. And so, um, as I'm sure you know, and so... Um, one of the indicators that maybe the world is doing okay is commodities like met coal, because if we if we're truly heading into a, a worldwide recession, you might see a different price than where we are today. Um, but you know, um, our call on energy as it relates to recessions in a particular economy was limited to the U.S. and limited to 2024. Um, don't forget, many people thought we'd see a recession in the U.S. when. Jerome Powell um, raised rates from zero to five at the speed with which he did, and it didn't materialize. And at the same time, I, we and others thought that, you know, production in the shale patch would turn over. And now that Biden was no longer draining the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, we'd see oil begin to elevate again. And that would pressure Powell to keep rates higher, and that could lead to a recession. None of those things happened. And so what did we get wrong? We got wrong the the proliferation of, of production in the shale patch. And, and until that turns over, so like what are the markers we would look for um, Marcellus gas production. You know, if we turn on the Mountain Valley pipeline and we don't see a bump up in production in Marcellus, that means we're seeing curtailment. Uh, or as the team at uh, Gehring and Rosenzweig believe, perhaps um, we're reaching geologic limits of the Marcellus shale. We happen to not think that, but they do, and, and they've studied it uh, much more than we have. Uh, if we see production in the Permian really roll over, as as Luke Roman um, has written that he, he's concerned about, or and others have well, including Gehring and Rosenzweig, then that would change the equation. Um, 
And so we, we will react to the data as it comes in. Um, but for now, um, you know, coke and coal being where it is, while thermal coal is cheap, it doesn't necessarily surprise us. Mm. Okay, fair enough. I'm not intelligent enough to ask any questions around that, so I'll just take your word for what it is. Um, what <laughs> It's always fun talking about what you got wrong and, and who you disagree with, but there's one thing that you didn't get wrong, at least one, there's probably more, and one thing that you also agree with Adam on, and that's uranium. Uranium has done pretty well. Um, if you had a thesis of peak cheap uranium a couple of um, months ago, you, you did very well. Is that changing? Is your view on uranium changing? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I did a podcast with Justin, and um, and and I had mentioned that I was short term a little cautious. Uranium, you know, things don't go up exponentially. I think long term, the case for uranium is is pretty sound. The thing about uranium that makes it different than natural gas and oil and coal is the price of uranium could triple or quadruple from here, and and nobody would really care because the the input cost of running a nuclear power plant. I mean, uranium is certainly a cost, but it, it's it's not like such a direct one-to-one -one cost as you're, you know, you're burning the fuel uh, at a natural gas plant or coal, right? And so the, the the transfer function between nuclear energy and the cost of uranium, and, and of course, all the steps in between, we're just talking about, of course, you know, uranium uh, at the front end of the supply chain getting expensive. There's all manner of value-added steps you need to do. And in fact, that's the subject of the February Doom Zoom. We have a great guest coming on to walk us through the entire uranium supply chain. I'm looking forward to recording that next week. Um, but but when you see sort of um, what my friend Tony Greer would call Icarus prints, like we we've seen recently on the march, you know, to over a hundred dollars a pound, um, we had cautioned that um, if we were in the trade and we're not, and we had done very well, it might be time to think about hedging a little bit or taking a bit of risk off. And um, and I think. Um, Cameco's earnings sort of marked a, a local top, perhaps, and and we'll see. I think it's good and healthy to have some consolidation and pullback after large runs like this, so you could base the next leg up. Uh, we remain structurally bullish nuclear energy. Um, we remain structurally um, bullish slash interested in uranium in, in timeframes measured than years in years, but we don't trade it. Um, and we've decided, uh, as a general rule, we used to be long uranium, and we wrote about it. At, We've just decided that, as a general rule, we we won't write about anything that that we're financially in, you know, um, invested in, uh, just to keep it clean. Because ultimately, you know, we, we're, the business matters more than the returns on any particular investment of ours. Fair enough. So, what do you do? Just sort of low cost index fund. This sort of is an aside. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the vast majority. So uh, I've, I've said this on other shows, and maybe even said it on yours. And um, we earn money in fiat because we live in a fiat world. We save money by buying real assets like gold and land and collectibles. So I am long gold and I, I don't think, mm. you know, uh, our position in gold influences our opinion on it, nor can we influence the market if we wrote about it. But we always disclose that we're long gold if we write about gold. Uh, and then we n mostly invest privately um, where we can affect the outcome. Um, we, we, we pretty good experience in our team in private equity and venture capital. And okay. we love those markets. And um, if we can invest with uh, a management team that we know personally that we can help directly, we could share our contacts with, our knowledge, our Rolodex of friends um, and scientists who know things, um, th then we could create what we call sweat alpha. That has worked well for us. Private mar market investing is not for everybody. It, co it comes with serious risks, uh, not the least of which liquidity uh, can be a big challenge, but we've been defrauded and people have stolen money from us. But at the same time, we've had some some huge home runs. and. Um, and so um, over time, we've gotten better at it. And that's how we prefer to put risk on in our personal lives. And of course, the the biggest asset um, right now in my portfolio is the present value of, of future earnings from Doomberg. And that gets the vast majority of my time mm. uh, because, um, you know, we get to eat what we kill. Um, and so um, we're go we're, we've gone on a good hunt. And, you know, if we get a bison, we get the whole bison. Uh, we're not, you know, employees who only get uh, whatever piece of the steak our bosses decide to give us. And so... Um, if we work really hard and we have a good year and we delight our subscribers, um, we add to our net worth. And if we do the opposite of those things, um, it subtracts from our net worth. And so that's the way we view Doomberg as one of our private investments. Your venture capital adventures, is that within, because I know you have a chemical background, is that within the chemical sector? Is it within the energy sector or something the, else completely? Or It's in whatever we think will win sector. And, um, you know, um, having built a business ourselves, um, 
very systematically through the five pillars of brand, channel, technology, demand creation, and operations. Um, we have been able to help you know, aspiring CEOs build great startups using that framework, and, and, and it works. It's pretty universal. And so um, you know, the, the, the outlines of what make for a successful startup are, are pretty interesting, and I think pretty programmable. And so, but we do private equity type investments as well. And, um, you know, a bit of, um, speculation and land. So land is, is, a, a, is a vehicle for saving, but at the same time, no, you can buy land with timber or gravel on it and, mm. you know, um, harvest, um, those things in tax advantage ways, and then reconstitute the land and hold it for a bit and then sell it for a capital gain. And th those things aren't going to be, um, you know, um, career makers, but you, you can do pretty well. Um, and a thing I like about doing such projects is they're, they're not subject to the whims of the, you know, uh, of the politicians, um, to, to, to the most extent, at least anyway, you have much more direct control over things. Um, I can't beat the supercomputers on wall street picking stocks. I mean, there, there are people who can, and, um, I, I just decided that I can't and I don't enjoy it. And so that's not what we do. Still energy dependent, though. Those, uh, well, all of the investments actually that you mentioned here are, are still related to everything is really related to energy and what we've been talking about previously. How do you incorporate that in your in your day to day activities? Yeah, well, we we have plenty of investments that don't incorporate energy. I'm just saying, um, you know, energy of course saturates the economy and is the economy. But there are you know, downstream from energy. If somebody came to us with an AI pitch, you know, we would look at it, and you know, somebody came to us with a consumer product pitch. If somebody came to us with a roll-up of, I don't know, dental offices in a certain region of the country that has not yet been subjected to the to the machine of private equity, we would look at any deal um, on a risk-adjusted return basis. And the primary prism through which we would view such deals is, is, is our impact, our potential impact. Are we just going to be a sidecar investor on something that's good, or are we going to be a direct investor who, who has access to the team and, and can help them directly? Those are considerations. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, private investing is really fun. At the same time, it's challenging. It's hard. The biggest challenge is deal flow and being, you know, invited into the right deals. You know, but there's an old saying, which is every deal is undersubscribed except for the ones that are oversubscribed. And, um, and you know, the, the market has a way of uh, exhibiting a bit of a herd mentality, which then makes the timing of when you can and, and do exit um, all the more interesting. It's a whole different world. You know, we pondered starting other sub stacks and one might be, uh, you know, uh, under a different brand and masthead uh, in the space of, of private investing. I think it's a fascinating um, market that's not really well covered for the for the general public. And so, but, you know, that, that would take away from the work of my life. And so we probably won't do it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Where You mentioned something that I want to go back to about uranium here is that, um, you mentioned it might be time or it, it might be a, an idea to start looking for potential hedges to uranium. What would be a hedge to uranium, given how uncorrelated it is to most things in the economy? Oh, but you can buy, you know, protective put options in various uranium focused ETFs. Mm. Um, and you, you could take some of your profits off the table. And again, this all comes down to everybody's individual appetite for risk, their time frame in the trade. But, you know, when you see us, you know, I mean, NVIDIA, as we're talking, of course, is up, you know, some crazy amount today after releasing earnings. And so things can go vertical for a very long time. And there are people in the trade who would rather not risk a massive upside move that they believe is coming. And, and to them, I would say, ignore everything we say. But I was just saying, like, in my experience, you know, if, if something you're holding that has been beaten down forever suddenly triples, and because the triple of uranium has been rather sudden, if you plot it on a on a 10 year or 15 year chart, um, you know, it's just, it's just ponder whether it might be time or at least have the question, like the, the, the tops aren't marked, um, by, um, uh, by feelings of, of despair. Of course, they are marked by feelings of euphoria. And so if you, if you scroll uranium Twitter, there's an understandable amount of excitement out there because they have been beaten down for so long and they finally were able to spike the football. And I'm happy for my friends that are long uranium. We have plenty of friends who are long uranium. Um, but again, if you're, if you're an investor and you believe in the thesis and you think it's going to 200 or 300, then don't listen to us. But, um, you know, nobody ever went broke taking a bit of profit off the table. That's a fair point. I find you twit kind of um, a difficult indicator because everybody is always so bullish. And uranium <laughs> is just a, its own thing. I mean, yeah. people are bullish right now despite the 
massive correction that we've been going through over the last couple of days. Do you ever look at the um the way the books, the contract books of the producers are set up and and analyze those in regards to how that might influence the overall market? I, I really can't say that that's an area of expertise of ours. Um, and so I'd like to highlight when we haven't done the work, and, and this is one case where where we we really haven't. Um, there are others who have, and you can find them on on YouTube. And I would encourage people uh, to go find people who have spent the time to do it. I mean, um, there are people in the industry who say that the contract books matter, matter way more than spot price. But, you know, if you're invested in, say, the spot vehicle, then the spot price is all that really matters to you. And so you should understand what moves it. Um, but, uh, you know, and I'll probably learn a lot more as I listen to the to the February Doom Zoom um, as well. So we're looking mm -hmm. forward to that. Yeah. Who do you who do you follow? I mean, you don't have to tell me who is on the Doom Zoom or do if you want to market it in any way oh but yeah um i will you know not being on twitter anymore um we, we don't really follow um we don't really follow anybody the the i mean i looked sometimes and i have you know the old classic list of people that you would follow on on uranium you can find such lists available and um, the guest we have is uh, james krellenstein who's a physicist with a uh, pretty deep experience in nuclear power and um, he's going to deliver a presentation called from ore to core understanding the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle, which uh, we're pretty excited about hearing. Uh, we have two tiers of subscribers at Doomberg. We have our regular subscribers who get all of our articles for free and can participate in the comments. And then once a month, we um, do a Doom Zoom. Either I deliver you know, a presentation on behalf of the team, or we have a, a high-profile guest who can deliver a similar quality presentation on something we couldn't do ourselves. And that's what we decided to do for the February session uh, with James. Looking forward to that. Very cool. Um, you've also been venturing a little bit into or writing about gold, as you mentioned, you have a personally a position in physical gold. What, how do you, I mean, yeah, where was this, where is this coming from? Uh, we also have a very large, you know, not very large, but a meaningful position in, um, uh, fizz, you know, the, the Sprott gold product, uh, as well. And as I said earlier, we view gold primarily as a savings vehicle. Um, and if a private investment opportunity arrives, we, you know, create liquidity by selling some of our gold or other assets. And and that's the source of liquidity we use for such investments. Hmm. I think gold is setting up for a very interesting 2024. We wrote a piece in mid-January called Golden Resolution. And, you know, there's sort of two big beliefs in the gold community, which is as uh, perennially bullish, perhaps, as, as the uranium folks are. Um, and frankly, a high degree of overlap between the two communities. Um, the one is that the price of gold has been suppressed by the paper markets. Um, and the other is that the U.S. dollar dominance is coming to an end. And when it does, gold will reassert itself uh, in its rightful place as a uh, neutral reserve asset, uh, which is different than a, a reserve currency, of course. And um, 2024 looks set to shine a significant light on both of those, um, driven in the first part by the the growth of the Shanghai physical gold markets and the ability to arbitrage London and New York. And so if the big banks are truly suppressing the price of gold in the paper markets, then the net result of that will be gold will flow from the West to the East. And eventually that has to be reflected in the markets unless the Western nations have decided they no longer are interested in holding physical gold. And I suspect the opposite is true. Um, the second is the big question um, confronting us here soon is whether the U.S. Will, and the EU will um, fully confiscate as opposed to just having frozen Russia's assets reserves and effectively give them to Ukraine. And if they were to do that, I think that would cause a significant dislocation in the markets for Western debt, which have served as um, reserve assets. But such acts would erode the neutrality of those reserve assets. And so that would be pretty bullish for gold as well. Um, we we upped our allocation of gold um, heading into 2024 um, for these reasons. And we, we would, uh, if gold suddenly re-rates higher, we would um, want to make sure that our personal savings um, are protected uh, from such an event. Um, but um, you know, we, we didn't take a strong position either way. Our, our, our primary view is um, if there's going to be a year where the price suppression of gold is 
finally abated, this would seem to be the year. And if we do go ahead, which seemed more likely then than it does now that we're going to seize Russia's assets, um, then that would also be a pretty significant catalyst for a run on the bank, so to speak, a uh, run on the volts. Hmm. What would a re-rate look like um, in terms of time, but also obviously in terms of size? Well, I mean, if if a major oil producer started overtly pricing product in ounces of gold, again, this is an idea that Luke Roman has articulated that we find compelling. And so I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, you would very quickly see a significant re-rating of gold higher than here. I don't know, 2,500, 3,000. Some people dream of 5,000 or 10,000. We don't dream of those scenarios because actually that would be a sign of significant catastrophe in the US, which is where we live and our families reside and and most of our assets are held. And so um, we don't view a re-rating of gold as an event to celebrate. We view that as an insurance policy having paid off akin to, well, my house burned down, but at least it's insured. I, I, I pay my insurance every year and I don't want my house to burn down and I don't begrudge the money I spent to pay that insurance when the calendar turns and my my home is still standing. <laughs> uh, and so um, we would much prefer um, gold stay where it is because mm -hmm. more of our assets are not in gold. Um, gold is just a partial hedge against currency debasement. Um, it has stood the test of time. We don't believe today's suite of politicians are, cap are capable of resisting the temptation to debase the currency. And so we need to have at least some of it. Um, but I would view land as just a more illiquid, but a potential higher upside version of gold. Um, certainly there's more um, local knowledge that can affect your outcome in such adventures, which um, we, we don't tend to invest in things we don't know. Um, but gold, you know, I think having a reasonable allocation, and for me, a reasonable allocation is, is you know, 10% of my financial net worth is probably in gold today, plus or minus. Um, so it's not like a core position. Um, most of my core positions are in, you know, um, in, in privately held companies that, that produce value that uh, have relatively good hedges against inflation because they have pricing power. 10% is probably still like a thousand percent more than, than sure. most people. <laughs> yeah, so. most people have none. So it's an infinite amount more than most people. Okay. That's true. Would it, yeah. But if you have this sort of worldview or, or view on, on the US where you say no recession, not before the Polish election, or, yeah, before the election, right? Right. Complete, yeah. And you have, you know, not as bullish energy, which I mean, if it's if it's bearish energy, or if it, if if energy stays uh, or or goes lower from here, again, that's good for the gold producers. And you expect higher gold price. Why not leverage yourself with gold stocks? Because we don't speculate um, in in publicly traded securities by and large. Um, hmm. It's just not. First of all, um, we have no market edge. I mean, people can do the same math that you and I can do. I think the markets are relatively efficient. I think if we were forced to trade uh, or to invest in public markets, we would probably just buy the index funds passively, which is becoming more and more common and a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, you know, we might sell calls against those and generate some income and so on, but we wouldn't really be adding much value um, uh, as investors. And so... You know, when you start to speculate in junior miners, you have to know the management teams and that industry is replete with, you know, the occasional huckster. Uh, and so um, we don't have the time um, to, to assess management teams of publicly traded gold miners to the extent that we, we do, you know, CEO teams of startups where we used to work with one of the one of the executives and this is their startup and they reach out to us for advice and we spend two days with them giving them all the cheat codes that we learned while we built Doomberg and mm. and and everything we learned uh, assessing hundreds of, of VC startups um, in the various ways in which we've participated in the VC market and so um, I can't get the CEO of pick your favorite junior gold miner on the phone I mean I, I suppose I could probably get uh, get them to speak about their stuff on Doomberg um, but um, then I wouldn't invest in them because we have this rule or we don't, you know, um, invest in things that we write or, or, or highlight. Um, and so it, it, it's just not, not something that's on our radar. Look, lots of people love it. Um, they read reports, they, they even fly out. I, I'm, I'm very good friends with a very well-known, you know, a large um, investor in the commodity sector um, whose name I will withhold, but I, I know this person personally for a variety of reasons and they do quite well, but they get on the plane and they go visit, 
the geologists and they tour the facilities and they meet with management and they have access to information that that I don't have the time or the skills to properly collect or or comprehend. Fair so point. I don't do it. Yeah. No, fair point. Would would you expect though the all in sustaining costs to keep they have been coming down a little bit. Uh they have they seem to have peaked, but is this peak AI SC? Yeah, it um it's no question that with diesel cheap um it's going to be cheaper to run mines. Now, there's other complexities like permitting and grades and taxes and you know um, the the social stability of where your mine happens to be located and um, the the uh, grip with which the locality um, has on your environmental remediation efforts and the timing of those expenses and it's very complex. And again, this this complexity is unique to each company to down to each mine and and very difficult for us to model and people who do it do it quite well. They can make a lot of money. So for example, in a world where Doomberg comes to an end, um, I've long thought that one of the things I might do is just pick a commodity market and only trade that, like study it for a year before trading. And in fact, one of the markets that I was thinking about trying to understand and only trade is cooking coal, as we talked about earlier, because it's a relatively simple market. There's all manner of uh, information sources available. And that's the kind of market where if you work really, really, really hard, you can get a very slight edge that you can exploit um, uh, over people that are sort of um, tourists in that market. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that I think would better fit my personal personality and the personality of the team, which is where you you do a very deep dive in a very narrow area and only trade that. So if I were to trade stocks, I'd probably pick five high quality companies and trade around them. Hmm. Study everything, read all the reports, learn how it trades, get a feel for things. You know, in a way that sort of copy is a is a you know, he tries to trade inflection points and he has very few concentrated positions and seems to have done well for himself. Not a not a commercial for copy. I mean I I know him personally and 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 I enjoy speaking with him. But um that's the kind of thing we would probably do if we you know but that takes time and right now I don't have time. We're producing you know, 1,500 to 2,000 words every four days, uh, which have to be researched, written, edited, promoted, and defended because we have our comment section open to our subscribers. And if we make a mistake, they're the first to tell us. And, um, you know, and, and we get all kinds of feedback and questions and critiques of our work, and we try to answer every single one of them. Um, and so I just don't have the time to do it today, but I love what I'm doing. So why would I want to create that time? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. With the with the with, with everything that we've said, actually, so far today, we've talked about China, we talked about coal, energy another big thing that is intertwined with the economy if you will is is copper that we haven't really been talking about but when you were mentioning all those risks that typically uh, that tip that, that that you typically see around gold mines well all of them seem to have been happening pretty much all at once over the last 18 months with copper is that a market you're paying attention to uh we pay attention to copper for the following reason um which may be um, surprising to you, but we have long pondered why it is that coal, oh, sorry, that copper is so cheap um, if we're on the cusp of an ESG revolution. And it's just not in there. It's just not in the markets. Like the markets aren't, if we were really going to build out electric vehicles and solar and wind to the extent that we've been told, you wouldn't expect copper to be where it is, hmm. especially in the face of low quality mines that we can tap into of ever decreasing grades and, you know, um, expense to, to pull the stuff out of the ground and to concentrate it and, and so on. And so we think the lack of price action in the copper market has been puzzling to us. Um, and I think if you look at the latest sort of news flow in the, uh, in the electric vehicle space, I think I would say that the, the market for, Copper has gotten it right. You know, if you just look at the monthly 30-year chart of, um, you know, the three-month forward rolling contract, it's it's roughly where it was um, heading into the financial crisis of 2008, hmm. you know, plus or minus. And then when you adjust for inflation, same thing with oil. It's, it's even cheaper than that. And so, um, again, when you're measuring things like copper, you're measuring the price of copper and the price of the dollar. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've always found it interesting that, Copper really hasn't blown up, like in the way nickel did, for example, before the the great uh, controversy, um, you know, uh, that that happened in that market. 
Um, sure. We didn't see that super spike. The way uranium is spiking, like the market is telling you there's a legitimate shortage of uranium and producers need to get going. Um, we're not seeing that uh, in the market for copper, especially correcting for the relatively pitiful quality of growth potential projects on the board compared to historical. Auto auto producers, car makers are confirming that too. I just tweeted out something that I pulled up here uh, this morning. It's a it's a Reuters headline that reads: Mercedes Benz toned down expectations on electric vehicles demand and said it will update its combustion engine lineup well into next decade, becoming the latest car maker to flag a slower than expected appetite for battery powered cars. This is happening across the board. They're not the only ones. Yeah, the big winner in this, of course, will be BYD. We wrote about this um, late last year. Build Your Dreams was the title of the piece. You know, BYD is just a machine. They started out many moons ago. I remember personally visiting uh, auto shows in China and seeing the first Frankenstein car, which was a almost a near complete ripoff of Corolla's uh, the, of Toyota's Corolla. We, we chronicled that in the piece. And you know, when you don't have to, when you can just steal all the Western technology and you don't have to create it in house, and then cherry pick the best from all of the Western producers and then mix in an enormous amount of government support. It's impossible that you can't win, but man, they were producing some amazing EVs and more importantly, plug-in hybrids at shockingly cheap prices. I saw a report yesterday, plug-in hybrid with 35 miles of range and a 1.5 liter engine really well appointed for the equivalent of 14,000 US dollars. And they're just going to wipe everybody's, uh, you know, they're going to, they're, they're going to, be stiff competition, and I expect to see trade barriers thrown up to stop them from from flooding the markets because they have, as the Chinese always do, after they steal everything, they dominate it by exploiting cheap labor and uh, cheap dirty coal and and government uh, largesse because they have decided that batteries is a strategic market for them. Um, and so we're just at the beginning of the Western automakers struggling with EVs in our view. And if the Chinese are allowed to import um, whatever they can export into markets like Europe, boy, the, the Mercedes and the VWs and, and the BMWs of the world are in for a world of hurt. Hmm. I, I'm opening up um, an overview of, of what's in an EV battery, um, which what all that you're telling me here is, is not very bullish graphite, nickel, lithium, um, manganese, cobalt, all these things. Well, it all depends against current market expectations, of course. Um, you know, we, we would say that you could still grow EVs and we do expect them to grow. We just don't expect the internal combustion engine to materially go away anytime soon in the same way that we don't expect coal to peak anytime soon. Um, but, you know, these markets are all cyclical, <laughs> as we've said repeatedly. Um, and there was this belief that an enormous amount of demand would materialize and, and the market initially responded to that. But now we're starting to see these prices come off. As um, as the realities of the difficulties of owning EVs outside of major population centers shrinks the addressable market. Mm. And then, again, you have whatever's happening in China. I recently read someone on Twitter said something along the lines of, as China goes, so does copper. And China is not going. Copper is not going to be going. Something along those lines. For now, but India is going pretty good. And, you know, these things, these things are all flows that are very difficult to model, of course. But the... Right. India is growing at a pretty strong pace right now, and their demand for commodities is 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 growing. And if you look at their BTUs per GDP, they got a long way to go to catch up to China, let alone to the U.S. And so you know, there's there's always going to be pockets of growth. Um, there are always going to be pockets of challenges. Look, there's a big challenge in the U.S. with commercial real estate, and and you know our view, of course, is the Fed will extend and pretend that through the election, which is again um, to the extent that a crisis materializes. Um, I think the Fed is very political, and so they will intervene uh, for political reasons. So, you know, the entire Washington, D.C. establishment is uh, both terrorized and hell-bent on preventing a return of Donald Trump. And so I think they will do whatever they need to do to prop up the economy, whoever is at the top of the Democratic ticket. Um, it might not work. Um, you could hope that it doesn't work, but the reality that it's going to be attempted is not something that you should ignore. Hmm. Seems like, again, we've come full circle. Um, you know, co Commodities are cyclical. Uh, what am I? Uh, what am I not asking you though? You talk to a lot of people, all of which are much smarter than me. Well, what are they asking? Is that I'm not asking you? No, I think we covered a pretty wide range, to be honest with you. And I would say that you're a uh, pretty smart guy. I wouldn't uh, undersell yourself. I think, you know, the, the the we just put a piece out called Full Circle, um, which 
uh, ironically categorized Germany's uh, you know, as a case study in climate insanity taken to its sort of inevitable end point. But we let, we ended that piece with a with a, a hopeful message that we suspect that we must be near the bottom uh, in Germany. And to the extent that they're a test case, we could take comfort in the inevitability of a rebirth. I think the days are uh, of the current ruling coalition are undoubtedly numbered and the friction of the transition might be formidable, but the inevitability of how the cycle turns um, will reassert itself as well, even in Germany. And the war in Ukraine won't last forever. Um, the current slate of politicians won't rule forever. But what will remain is the persistence of humanity's desire to ever, uh, improve standards of living, which can only be done through the systematic discovery, exploitation, and harnessing of primary energy, which is why it grows at 2% per year forever. And uh, we believe, by and large, uh, it will well into the future. Hmm. Well, you're not coming back to Twitter, are you? Uh, we There's possibilities that we might end up going back to Twitter, but not under the current ownership and especially not under the policy of subjecting Substack uh, writers to uh, throttling and uh, and you know, making it very difficult for people to um, promote their product. Look, we, we do this for a living. We have a small team. There's only so much we can do. And we decided that the return on effort on Twitter no longer made sense. And nothing about the reasons why we left Twitter um, have changed since we have. And frankly, our business has done fine without it. I, I still enjoy perusing Twitter. It is still a great source of knowledge and information. Um, it is a unique product. I hope it survives. Um, I hope it thrives, regardless of who owns it. Um, but it's just not a place where we can deploy our limited resources in, in today's environment.